Let me now um, briefly introduce our distinguished keynote speaker, um, Justin Lin from the World Bank. Justin Yifu Lin, a Chinese national, is the senior vice president and chief economist of the World Bank, a position he has held since June of 2008. He's the first chief economist from a developing country. In his current position, Mr. Lin guides the bank's intellectual leadership and plays a key role in shaping the economic research agenda of the institution. Prior to joining the bank, Mr. Lin served for 15 years as founding director and professor of the Chinese Center for Economic Research at Peking University. He received his PhD in economics from the University of Chicago in 1986 and is the author of 18 books, including The China Miracle, Developing Strat Development Strategy and Economic Reform, and Economic Development and Transition, Thoughts, Strategy, and Viability. He has published more than 100 articles in refereed international journals and collected volumes on history, development, and transition. There are many, many more honors and uh, things he has accomplished, which I will not name in the interest of time. His arrival at the World Bank has brought new perspectives on development and his views on the role of the state and industrial policy is shaping development thinking within and outside the World Bank. And we're very pleased to have you here to talk precisely about those issues, about uh, uh, industrial policy, about the role of the state in your keynote address on new structural economics, a framework for rethinking economic development. Welcome, Mr. Lim. Uh, thank you very much for the nice introduction. And it's a great honor to have the opportunity to share with you some of my ideas about development economics with PECNET. And today I'd like to cover five areas. The first one, I'll talk about why we need to have a rethinking of development economics. And then I'd like to present my ideas about a new framework for development economics, which I call new structural economics. And then I'll apply this new structural economics in the context of the government policy in promoting industrial upgrading, structural transformation. And I also like to use this framework to see what are the new opportunities for countries in Africa, in South Asia, in this multipolar growth world? And then I'll have a very brief concluding remarks. Well, since 2008, I'm sure all of you either read from newspaper or participate in some kind of conference to rethink economic theory. And why economic crisis generated so many rethinking of economic theory? I think it's related to the nature of economic theories. Because from what I see, the function of economic theories is to explain the observed economic phenomena. What are the causes, what are the consequences of those causes that generated in this phenomenon to help us to understand that? But the purpose is not only understanding. Based on those kind of understanding, it will inform the policy choice of the government or the decision making of a firm in order to improve the result. And whenever the economic theory can explain the observed phenomenon, or if we base on the economic theory to firm our choices, but we cannot achieve the intended goal, then we need to rethink economic theory. And certainly, the current economic crisis show that the inability of the existing theory to predict the crisis will provide a policy option 
to get out of the crisis. So we have so many rethinking. And if we use this criterion, we all find development economics, since its formation in the post-World War periods, has been always on the process of rethinking. We know that in the post-war periods, the development economics was dominated by a group of economists called structuralists. At that time, their understanding for the economic backwardness in the low-income country was because they did not have the same modern advanced industries as a high-income country. And their explanation for the failure of the low-income country to have those kind of industry was because of there's a lot of market failures. And the policy recommendation was to use government innovation to overcome those kind of policy failures in a policy framework called import substitution strategies. But country you follow those kind of policy in general perform miserably. And because of that, by the time of 1970s, 1980s, there was a rethinking. And the rethinking tried to explain how come the developing country performed so poorly. And the understanding of the time was because government failures. And so the COP policy recommendation was to allow market to function. And so the policy recommendation were liberalization, privatization, stabilization, the so-called Washington Consensus. And again, country you follow those kind of policy recommendation, their performance was mixed, was mixed. And some even perform poorly. But certainly, since the Second World War, there were some economies or countries are doing quite well. The first one, like Japan, East Asian economies like Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore. And then if you look into the policy framework that they adopted, a different from the recommendation from the dominant thinking at that time, because they did not follow import substitution. They actually adopted expert promotion. And then in the 1980s, 1990s, and now, during the period of time, most countries in the developing world were on the process of economic reform or transition. As I mentioned, those countries follow the Washington consensus did not perform well, but there were some countries perform extremely well, like China, like Vietnam, or even area Mauritius Malaysia since 1970s. They did it very well. They did not follow those kind of structural P or Washington consensus. They follow an approach called dual track. They continue to provide some kind of support to the old sectors, but they liberalize the entry to the new sectors. And uh, both group of successful economies, there are some unique features. They all market-based economy were moving towards the market. In the process, the government all function very proactively. And you can see the successful experiences could not be put into the framework or either structuralist or Washington consensus. And so we need to have a rethinking. And I'd like to say, World Bank has been on the process of rethinking all the time. Certainly, the policy in the World Banks are heavily influenced by the dominant thinking. However, the World Bank has to deal with the crimes country on the daily basis. If some project did not work well, certainly World Bank need to have some rethinking. And uh, example is that in 1993, the World Bank published a book called the East Asia Miracle, and John Page, is John Page here? It's one of the men also. And uh, according to this East Asia miracle, they find 
those high-performing East Asian economies, their policy was export-orientation, and they also have a market-friendly government. That was the main finding. In the 1990s, 2000, the World Bank published another book called The Lessons of the 1990s to review the experiences of the East Asian, uh, East European countries' transition. And their finding was no one side fit all. So Washington consensus, those one size policy could not work. And the most recent one was 2009, the Growth Commission report. And led by the Nobel Prize winner, Michael Spence. And they studied 13 economies since the Second World War. Those 13 economies, they achieved 7% or more annual growth rate continuously for 25 years. And they find among those 13 economies, they have five status facts. One is that they are all open economy. Second, they all achieve mega stability. The third one, they have high rate of saving, high rate of investment. The first one, they all rely on market mechanism for resource allocation. And the last one, they have committed credible, capable government. Those are their findings. Okay. And my new structural economics is a continuation of those kind of rethinking within the World Bank. And for the new structural economics, I'd like to explain how come I call it new structural economics. 